Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I am Jason Whitlock, your host. Happy, happy Friday. Oh, it's so awesome. It is Friday. We are here. Awesome show planned for you today. I can't wait for this discussion because I fell all the way down the rabbit hole that we're about to go deeper into. I don't know if any of you remember uh, the true crime uh, podcast documentary, Serial. Uh, it debuted in 2014. It really started all of this true crime madness that we have uh, going on now. Well, if you know the story, uh, it's about this kid, Adnan Saeed, who, has, who got uh, uh, convicted of murdering his former high school girlfriend. They were in high school at the time. I think he was 17, she was 18. Hey Min Lee was her name. Anyway, this podcast was awesome. Left you on the edge of your seat at maybe 12, 13, 14 episodes. Each episode left you on the edge of your seat. Wonder, did Adnan really do it? it, it did, did Jay, uh, you know, the, the number one witness against him, did he do the killing? Uh, was it her new boyfriend that worked with her at some lens crafter store? You know, Anyway, it was an amazing story that raised all kinds of questions about Adnan Saeed's guilt, and it, it kicked off a craze of true crime in the podcast space. It, it comes on the heels of all the documentaries that HBO and other uh, cable outlets do about true crime. Th this serial was making a murderer before making a murderer. Well, now there's a new twist, and we're gonna get to the author of the new twist, guy named Andrew Hamill, an American living abroad, living over in Germany. He's written a terrific piece uh, about the case, and we're gonna go in depth with him about that. Uh, for those of you that, and, and I'm gonna connect this, and this conversation will connect this to larger issues going on in American culture and all of that. Uh, so b before we bring Andrew on, I wanna take care of one of my favorite sponsors, a, a sponsor that's, helping me as I uh, try to lose weight, as I, not try to, as I lose weight, and as I address my health, uh, I've been leaning into Nugenix. Uh, guys, are you ready to boost your testosterone and get your old self back? Our sponsor, Nugenix Total T, is offering a complimentary bottle when you text 231231 and enter the keyword fearless. Are you really ready to lose your shape, your muscle, your energy? As men age, we lose free testosterone, the man hormone. We lose that fire. It's harder to feel as alive, as energetic, be as active. It's even harder to stay in shape. Now you can get that old fire back with Nugenics. Want more energy, more power to fight the negative physical effects of aging? Nugenics Total T Testosterone Booster with Testafin will help you turn back the clock and re-energize your life. It'll help you look and feel like the man you want to be. And now get a complimentary bottle when you text 231-231 and enter the keyword fearless. This is the unprecedented formula with science-backed key ingredients to safely maximize your free and total testosterone levels, help you increase muscle mass, and skyrocket your performance as you age. Nugenics is also the number one doctor-recommended testosterone booster boosting brand. If you're not totally satisfied, Nugenix will refund 100% of your purchase price plus shipping and processing. Now get a complimentary bottle of Nugenix Total Tea when you text 231231 and enter the keyword fearless text now and get a bottle of Nugenix Thermal X, our newest and most powerful fat incinerator ever with key ingredients to help you lose fast and get lean fast, absolutely free. That's 231231 and enter the keyword fearless Simple, 231231, keyword fearless. Texting enrolls you in recurring automated text messages. Consent not required to purchase. Message and data rates may apply. The number one doctor recommended brand by primary care physicians based on independent survey conducted by IQVIA in 2022. You guys are listening to me this week. I've started lifting weights again and implementing some new exercise, some new exercise getting just off my Stairmaster and just strictly cardio, that's why I'm leaning into Nugenics Total T. 
I need that boost of testosterone that all men as we age need. It's helping me as I start lifting weights again and try to shape my body and not just lose weight, but also shape and firm up. Uh, go ahead and do it with me, guys. Two, three, one, two, three, one. Fearless. Free bottle. Anyway. So uh, I want to, before we get to Andrew, I want to give you a little bit of background. Let's play, the, there's a trailer for the Serial Podcast that I want to play just to refresh your memory. Maybe some of you uh, have forgotten or maybe of you are unaware of Serial, but it was a very popular podcast. Let's play the Serial trailer. This is a Global Telling prepaid call from Adnan Sayed. An inmate at a Maryland Correctional Facility. From This American Life and WBEZ Chicago. Ground on the story. So that, that serial comes out in 2014. It sweeps the podcast world, ropes in people like me, thousands, millions of people around the country, ropes us all in. We're all addicted to it. It's so powerful that five years later, HBO does a documentary, which is basically based on the serial podcast. Uh, I think it was called The Case Against Adnan Saeed. Let's play that trailer. When you are working on a case that you think is a wrongful conviction, you're only on one side, and that side is getting to the truth. The day she went missing was just a normal day to me. It never hit me that something could be wrong until they found her body. The suspect is Adnan Musad Sayed. 그 아이를 죄를 주는 것밖에 는 바라는 게 없습니다. It felt like they got to have the wrong guy. If he did what he did, then who's the person that I saw every day in class? For years, I've been saying to Don, we should go to media, we should go to journalists, because they can do things we can't do. But nobody realized it's going to turn into anything big. Adnan Syed's story has captivated millions since the launch of the podcast Serial. Serial is what brought new evidence to the case. But Serial was not going to exonerate him. Now, 18 years after he was sent to prison, convicted murderer Adnan Syed heads back to court as questions about his case continue to surface. As investigators, we go beyond what law enforcement has already done. Failure to investigate more thoroughly is a major mistake. I never thought about him over all these years. This was a person that had a life. This is an interesting case, but it's people's lives. I know there are things that don't look good for me. I'm telling you, that's what happened. How could anybody think that he's being straight about this? That doesn't make him a killer. Makes him an unusual person. This is perhaps the critical piece to this case. They were going to follow that wherever it took them. This is a piece of evidence that nobody even realized existed. I want you to look into my eyes and tell me of your innocence. So I don't know if we're going to go here completely in my conversation with Andrew who's joining us from Germany, really appreciate him doing this. But I, I do wanna just set this framework up for a larger discussion that we may have at a later time on this show or after I'm done interviewing uh, 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 Andrew. This is a story about Sarah Koenig, the host of Serial, female journalist. Story about Rabia, Arabia Chavre, I believe. She's related to Adnan. She was the primary person who drove all the narrative that Adnan was wrongly convicted. She's worked tirelessly uh, to get Adnan's conviction overturned. This is a story about, and here now, this is a story about uh, the Baltimore State's attorney, I believe, I think her name's Marion or was Marion Mose. This is a story about women and the criminal justice system. In my, we won't probably go down this rabbit hole with Andrew, but when I walk away from this story, because I'm going to confess, I went down this serial rabbit hole in 2014, 15, whenever it was popular. I went so far down the rabbit hole, I reached out to Rabia, I, I donated money to Adnan's defense. And so here I am in 2023. 
you know, years after, I, I probably gave a thousand bucks to his defense. I can't remember. R Robbie and I exchanged emails at the time. But here I am now in 2023, and Andrew Hamill sitting over in Germany, he's an American citizen, but he's lived in Germany for quite some time. But he, he puts the case together about how, no, uh, Adnan's actually guilty. And his conviction has been wrongly overturned. And he wrote a great piece for Quillette. Uh, I think it published last week or within the last two weeks. I can't remember when I read it, but I immediately reached out to Andrew. I was like, man, I got to get you on the podcast. This blows my mind because all this pressure from Serial, from HBO, and then this state's attorney in Baltimore comes in out of nowhere. After this guy spent 20 years in prison, they exonerate this man and say that much of the defense was based on this uh, alibi witness named Asia McLean, who says that she was with Adnan at the time of the murder or whatever. Anyway, Andrew's reporting, writing, and telling the story blows up that entire narrative, says that, hey, this is just a really simple case, and the facts are overwhelming. This guy did it. Uh, Andrew's not real upset that Adnan is now free. He thinks that, you know, 20 some odd years in prison for a teenager that killed someone is probably appropriate, but he should not be exonerated. Well, I think it's the Supreme Court in Maryland eventually overturned the exoneration. I think the exoneration happened in September of 22, and then here a month or two ago, the Supreme Court comes back in and says, nah, we're not overturning this, uh, this is wrong. Adnan is still free, but his conviction is no longer overturned. There's, uh, I just read a story, I think today or yesterday, uh, the victim, Hey Min Lee's family, I think her brother is complaining and has filed complaints with the uh, Supreme Court about this case. They want Adnan back in prison, but Andrew Hamill, without further ado, without further setup, welcome to Fearless. Thank you for joining us. Uh, let's, let's just start, let's, let's start here basically. Who are you? Why are you interested in this case? Uh, when did it catch your attention? Why are you involved at all? Sure. First of all, Jason, thanks very much for having me on the show. It, uh, your request came out of nowhere. I got to admit, I hadn't even heard of you before, but that's my bad. Uh, my name's Andrew Hamill. I'm 53. I live in Dusseldorf, Germany. I was actually born in Belgium in 1968. Then our family lived around the world because my father was a chemical engineer, grew up mostly in Houston. I got my English degree from uh, the uh, University of Texas at Austin, Hook'em Horns. Then I worked for four years in a mental hospital because that's what you get with an English degree. Then I went to law school at the University of Houston, graduated in 1996. Then I worked for 10 years for an organization called Texas Defender Service. They still exist and they represent death row inmates in Texas and uh, they would be happy to have a contribution. They were great people. It was fascinating work. It was constitutional law and criminal law at a high level. Uh, but then, you know, the stress was too much for me. I just couldn't handle it. You're working 70, 80 hours a week. Uh, so I went to Harvard Law School and I got a master's in law and then I decided to become a professor. So uh, and then this fax came over and they said, we need somebody to teach American law in Germany. And I always wanted to maybe try living in Europe. So I went over and started living here and I just really liked it. I like the climate, I like the weather, I like the people. I've since learned to speak fluent German. And uh, I eventually, I got interested in this case. I mean, the first time I got interested was the time we all got interested when Serial came out in 2014. And I listened to it and I thought, it's, you know, there's a lot of issues here and there's a lot of things going on here. What's Jay's deal, et cetera. But I didn't give it much more thought. In uh, 2016, I decided to leave academia because it was kind of getting boring, become a translator and a writer and a journalist. And so the first couple of big journalist pieces, you know, and I concentrated on law 
because that's my, you know, that's how I was trained. I did a bunch of big journalist pieces, journalistic pieces on the case of Yins Suring, who was convicted in 1985 of a brutal double murder. You probably haven't heard of him. Not many people have, but be, he's a German guy. And so living in Germany, you know, in, he, he was, his case was big over here. I looked into it and I realized that his innocence claims were bogus. And I wrote a piece about it for Quillette <clears throat> and they were nice enough to publish it. And uh, I know an editor there, Jamie Palmer. He's a great guy, brilliant writer, brilliant editor. And so he said that last piece was really interesting and got a lot of engagement. You know, what else can you think of? So I looked into Adnan's case and, you know, of course, I watched all the documentaries and listened to all the podcasts. And then, you know, I went on Reddit and I realized that people on Reddit had unlocked a huge trove of information about the case and uh, that nobody, you know, the thing is Redditors had looked at it and analyzed it and come to the conclusion, most of them, that Adnan is clearly guilty, but nobody had really put it all together and brought it into sort of an accessible format. And so that's what I tried to do with this piece. It took me almost a year. I probably read half a million words, uh, but it's had a really positive resonance and I'm glad about that. The, and I've read part one and part two, and both of them are uh, wonderfully written, crafted, an economy of words despite being both really long pieces. And so it does not surprise me. It comes across like, wow, this guy put a year's worth of work into this. <laughs> this, could, this could easily be a book. T so for those of us like myself who listened to Serial, did our own little research in our spare time, and were convinced like, hey man, I think Jay is shady as heck. I think the police are shady. I think they're in bed with Jay. They're protecting him. He's, maybe he's an informant and he's connected, blah, blah. I, and so I just, he's, Adnan's innocent. There's just too many questions. There's certainly reasonable doubt. And how his lawyer didn't uh, bring Asia McLean to the stand is, is you know, reprehensible. And I reached into my pocket and went, Adnan's innocent, I gotta help. Why is Adnan guilty? What's the most damning evidence? Why are you convinced of his guilt? Sure, I mean, we can start with the sort of holy trinity of criminal cases, motive, means, and opportunity. So Adnan had a motive. He was, he had just been dumped by his girlfriend, Hey Min Lee, who he'd been dating for almost a year by that time. And he hadn't just been dumped. She left him and immediately began dating and sleeping with a romantic rival. And so uh, the relationship had been rocky. Hay had been trying, had broken up with Adnan a couple times because of his jealous, possessive, controlling character, which not, she confirmed this in her diary and her friends also confirmed it and teachers at Woodlawn High School where they went to high school. And when he read one of her breakup letters, one of his own friends said he, his face became flushed and his eyes began watering. And so in early January, 1999, he finds out that Hay has begun dating a coworker and sleeping with this coworker, a guy named Don, who we'll probably talk about. So it's sexual jealousy, which tragically is probably, you know, the oldest motive in humankind. Then we come to means. You know, did he have means to kill her? Yes, he got into her car alone and he was a strong athletic guy. He's about six feet tall, if not more. And he was able to smash her head against the side of the car. There was a severe bruise on her, uh, on her head, enough to possibly knock her unconscious. And then he strangled her to death. Personally, that's a very personal way of committing a crime. He was certainly strong enough to do it, and it's very common in domestic violence murders. And then opportunity. We have plenty of evidence that Adnan created a plan so that he could get Hay alone in her car on January 13th, 1999. He loaned his own car out to a friend of his. He asked Hay for a ride after school, which they did even after the breakup. And several of her friends remember Adnan asking 
hay for a ride after school. That puts him alone with her in her car. And then there's also, so that's the Holy Trinity that you've got. It's not enough on its own, but it's a lot. And then there's also the fact that Adnan repeatedly lied to the police about what he did, you know, what he asked Hay on January 13th, 1999. He gave multiple inconsistent statements about whether he wanted to get into her car and whether he asked her for a ride. Also, uh, Hay Min Lee is abducted and probably killed on January 13th, 1999. Before that time, Adnan had been calling and texting her several times a day after she disappears, but before anyone finds her body, Adnan stops calling or texting her at all. And so that's just, and also of course we have the personal eyewitness testimony of Jay Wilds. Jay Wilds testified that Adnan drove up to his home and popped up in Hay Min Lee's car on January 13th, 1999, popped open the trunk and showed Jay Wilds Hay Min Lee's, he, Lee's body inside the trunk of her own car. And Jay Wilds further testified that he helped Adnan bury Hay Min Lee in Leakin Park, right next to Baltimore. And the final sort of, uh, the, probably the final element that convinced the jury, there are more than this, but these are the main ones, is cell phone records. Back in 1999, there was no GPS, you could not pinpoint cell phones, but you could triangulate their approximate position. And the, the position of Adnan's cell phone destroys his alibi. He didn't actually have an alibi. He, couldn't rem he claimed he couldn't remember what he was doing during the crucial time period when Hei Win Min Lee was killed. But he said he never left the campus of the high school. His cell phone proves otherwise. It proves he was on the road and it proves that he was with Jay Wilds, the guy who testified against him. And it also proves that around 7 p.m. on the night of the 13th of January 13th, 1999, he was located somewhere in Leakin Park where Hayes' body was later found. That was the evidence that led the jury to convict. It only took them two hours they still stand by it to this day. I think one of the most damning things that I read in, in your piece is that Jay Wilds, who uh, sold weed to high school kids, including Adnan, he, he was out of high school, maybe 19, 20 years old, uh, kind of an operator in the, a low level operator in the Baltimore street life or whatever, uh, but, but but you know, I'll make a wire analogy because you and I are both fans of the wire. But you know, he he he's not Stringer Bell or uh, or Avon Barksdale. He he's kind of more the innocent. Uh, I'm, I'm trying now. I got to think of who he, he's almost like not not the younger version of Bubbles, the kid that was ran around with Michael and ended up being the next version of Bubbles. I, I can't believe I can normally call these guys off by name. I mean, I've watched The Wire so many times. But anyway, Jay is some low-level street guy. Call him Naaman Bryce. We'll call it, we'll, I'll use Naaman Bryce. As a, Naaman kind of wanted to be in that life, but he wasn't really built for it. That's who Jay Wilds is. The most damning thing in your piece was that Jay, by telling the police that Adnan drove up and showed him the body, and by taking the police to where the car was, Jay was taking a huge risk. If he's lying and Adnan didn't kill Hey Min Lee, then the police are gonna turn around and say, Jay, you had to have done it. How else would you know where the car is? How, how, else, would, uh, how, how else would you know any of this stuff if you hadn't done it? I just can't see Jay taking that kind of a risk if Adnan, because at that point he would not know, well, maybe Adnan's got a great alibi and he was with his mom and dad and his whole church and this is all going to blow up in my face. I thought that was the most compelling thing in your article. Yeah, and that is something that people who are pro Adnan just can't really get around. So, I mean, Jay Wilds, he's, uh, 
Um, he claimed in a 2015 interview that he was actually moving pretty serious weight of weed and was pretty scared. Uh, but, you know, he, he wasn't, you know, a major criminal. He wasn't a mastermind. He agreed to help Adnan out with Adnan's vague plans to get revenge on Hay. And uh, then, you know, suddenly he realizes Adnan's calling me up. He's got Hay's body in her own car. He's asking me to help bury her. He does it. And then he keeps silent. And he obviously hopes all this is going to just go away. Nobody will ever find Heyman Lee's body. And then it'll all just fade. But on uh, on February 9th, just under a month after the time she disappeared, her body's found. It's found in Leakin Park. And the police investigate several suspects, including Adnan, because obviously as the ex-boyfriend, he's high on their list, they get his cell phone records. And so what they see, you know, at this time, cell phone records from AT&T only said what calls came from the cell phone, outgoing calls. And they immediately see, the cops immediately see, this is in late February 1999, that there's a lot of calls placed to Jen Pusateri. So, and she is a friend of Jay Wilds. She is not a friend of Adnan. She doesn't know who Adnan is. She's no longer a student at Woodlawn High School. So the police go and interview Jen Pusateri. And you know she gives a couple of interviews to police, one with a lawyer. And she admits that she knows that Heyman Lee had been strangled to death. That was the means of her death. And so the police realize, OK, we have kept that information secret until now. And then, you know, so the first thing Jen goes, she calls up her friend Jay and says, Jay, man, the police have a list of calls. Your phone number is definitely going to be on there. What should we do? And Jay told her, tell the cops to come to me. You know, tell the truth to the cops. Tell them to come to me. Because Jay knew his number was up. His goose was cooked. They were going to find out his involvement. And he goes and he talks to detectives without a lawyer. And the very first meeting they had late on February 28th, Jay says, listen, this is what happened. You know, he changed a lot of the details later. We, you know, we can't say that Jay is a perfect witness. He changed his story a lot, but he led police to where Hayes' car was. He said, I can't give you an address. I don't remember the address, but put me in a squad car, drive me over there, and I'll show you where it was. And that's exactly what happened. So Jay knew where Hayes' car was. So he confesses to the police that he's deeply involved in covering up a murder. And if he didn't know that Adnan, you know, if Adnan had a perfect alibi and 50 people saw him at track practice and at school studying in the library, Jay is dead meat. I mean, he will be immediately charged with first degree murder for killing Hay, because how else could he know all of this stuff? And also Jen Pusateri, she would also be charged because she helped Jay get rid of the shovels and the picks used to bury Hay. And so if you wanna believe Adnan is guilty, you have, I mean, he's innocent, I'm sorry. You have to explain how did Jay Wilds know where Hay's car was parked out of all of Baltimore, you know, a city of 800,000 people. And also why would Jay Wilds and Jin Pusateri willingly confess involvement in a homicide that could come back and get them charged with murder. And really, Adnan supporters have no explanations for these things, at least not ones that are reasonable. The other people that I think don't have a reasonable explanation as I read your story, listen to you unpack it today, is the American media, and particularly the media in Baltimore, if a guy in Germany can research this and figure this out, why couldn't someone in the um, at the Baltimore Sun, at the New York Times, I mean, this was a national story. Serial is one of the most popular things to ever hit the podcast world. Everybody talked and wrote about this. Why is no American journalist writing, reaching the conclusions, connecting the dots the way that you did. And I know you're an American, but you're living in Germany. Oh, sure. Yeah, and right, you know, that's a really interesting question. And I think in many ways, that may be one of the most important questions this case raises, is that where was the journalists are so supposed to be skeptical. They're supposed to be looking for answers and questioning credibility and 
they were supposed to, be, you know, to take things apart from the very foundation and build a good story. But so many, I think, Serial started it out because Serial put forward this extremely compelling, incredibly masterfully well done series that had everyone hooked. And then the, this sort of like, you know, narrative gets established. And I think there's also a lot of groupthink among American journalists in certain situations. And I think that groupthink happened here. You know, sort of people on the who consider themselves progressive and nice and, you know, who who wanted to ensure social justice and reform the criminal justice system. They heard from other people they trusted that Adnan Syed got a raw deal. And they just assumed that that must be true because people I like and know and that I get along with every day uh, believe that. And they just didn't have, you know, they, they, they didn't have any motivation and they wanted to preserve their social contacts. I think one of the reasons I was able to get this done is precisely because I don't live in the USA. So I don't, you know, I'm not dependent on anybody. Nobody funds me except for me getting paid. I don't care, have to care who I pissed off. You know, I have a lot of liberal criminal defense lawyer friends who were pissed off by these articles. And, uh, but, you know, I, they understand that I'm, I'm a journalist now. I'm no longer an advocate. And so I think there's, you know, groupthink confirmation bias filter bubbles in many parts of the American media landscape. And that's why they miss this. The evidence was all there. It's all on the Internet. All you have to do is just sit down and read it. And uh, and lots of journalists just didn't do it. What has been the reaction? You, you said some of your lawyer friends upset with you, but uh, Rabia, uh, I, I don't know if I can pronounce her last name properly, Chabre or whatever, very charming, very uh, interesting, passionate person about Adnan's uh, defense and innocence. You wrote about how virtually everybody telling this story needed to stay in her good graces to get information, and that's also part of the reason why uh, this story has been told in such a distorted fashion. But have you heard from her? Have you? How has the reaction been to your piece? Well, the reaction, I mean, it's been really encouraging. I mean, first of all, I have to say David Simon, the producer of The Wire, retweeted it with praise. And I, that's, uh, that is an, an amazing feather in my cap because, uh, you know, I'm nowhere near the quality of a David Simon. The man is a genius who's produced fantastic television, very probing stuff. Um, and also, I've gotten a lot of you know, come back from other people who thought, you know, thought they knew what the case was all about, but they read the articles and they realized, no, there's a lot more to this than that. Now, I would have to say, I sent a draft of the entire article to most of the people I criticize in it. And I, I told all of them, please send this to anyone who cares, anyone you think might have a comment. And I'll put a comment in the article. And if you have a correction, I will come back and correct it. I never got any word back from any of them. They were not interested in defending their work. And Rabia has tried to ignore the article. She blocked me on Twitter, of course. Um, but, you know, she has mentioned it obliquely since then because, you know, I think she realizes that the article is getting traction. It's not some kind of crazy rant. You know, I really tried to put forward an honest case. And, I mean, I got to say, Rabia... Her, her commitment and her passion are legendary. She did a great job advocating for Adnan Syed. However, it is absolutely clear that she is not a reliable source of information. She had access to all the defense files for years. And I think that she, you know, sort of kept certain documents hidden and released other documents to friendly journalists and gave her side of the story, but not other sides of the story. I mean, Serial, you know, it's it's an okay podcast, but there is information in files that Sarah Koenig had access to that directly contradicts what you hear in Serial. And so either Rabia did not send these documents to Sarah Koenig, or Sarah Koenig saw these documents that directly contradict what you hear in Serial, what Adnan says in Serial. 
And she decided to ignore them. Because when you get on Rabia's bad side, she is a volcano. She's a pistol. She will really, really launch a campaign against you. So she hasn't done that with me yet. I'm happy to talk with her or debate with her about the case at any time. But, you know, she's she's too biased. She's too one sided. And no journalist should rely primarily on her for information about this case. Yet they did. Have you heard from Sarah, the host of Serial? Has she responded to anything that you've written or perhaps you reaching out to her? She has not. I sent her management firm and also Ira Glass a copy of, you know, a draft of the entire piece. I said, you know, I, I objectively criticize your piece in, you know, pretty stark terms here. And I would really like to have, you know, I'd love to have your input. I want to hear what you have to say and you know, how you came about this piece. Unfortunately, I have not yet received any answer from her. And I'll just give you one example of something that I find very problematic about the podcast. In episode two of the Serial podcast, Adnan Syed says from prison, he's you know calling her from prison, and he says, I would never have asked Hey Min Lee for a ride after school, never, because she always drove straight from Woodlawn High School to pick up her little cousins at the daycare center at three o'clock. So that's 45 minutes after school ends. She never, she would never have gone to McDonald's or 7-Eleven. I would never have asked her for a ride after school. However, there is a memo in the defense file. This is not prosecutors or their witnesses. In the defense file, Adnan talking to his own lawyer who says, oh yeah, me and Hay went to Best Buy all the time to have sex in our car right after school. So we drive to Best Buy, we'd have sex, and then Hay would leave and go pick up her cousins from daycare. Sarah Koenig said, that she'd gone through the entire defense file and looked for anything. So, you know, and I asked her on Twitter and I asked Ira Glass on Twitter, this is a major inconsistency. This is a serious problem with your piece. I'm not trying to do a hatchet job. I just want to get the facts. Did you read this memo that says the opposite of what you allowed Adnan Syed to say to 300 million listeners? And there's been total silence. Andrew, uh, there were some other realizations I had to come to reading your piece. Uh, some of them, they were places you were leading us, but you didn't spend a lot of time dwelling on it, but they were revelations I had to come to. It's like, whoa, I love making a murderer. And, and you make a little small comment in there about the, making a murderer is bogus as well. And, and, and what it leads me to the conclusion is like, there's so much money to be made right now as a documentarian or as a podcaster in this whole true crime, let's raise doubts about someone who's convicted. And so Karen, Sarah Koenig has too much of her brand and she's made too much money arguing that Adnan may be innocent to ever backpedal on that. And, and, and that there just seems to be in America money from sponsors or networks. Hey, if you got something that makes the American criminal justice system look corrupt, we will finance a documentary, a podcast or whatever that promotes that narrative. Is, is that how you see it from afar? Yeah, I think there, there's a lot to that. And there's a lot of explanations for that. First of all, is that true crime stuff is cheap to make. Uh, usually the entire story is in the public domain, so you don't have to pay for rights. You don't have to hire any actors. And if you get a hit like Making a Murder or Serial or you know The Staircase, et cetera, you'll make loads and loads of money. And you know, there's nothing wrong with that on its own. But the pro the the whole problem is, is that all of these podcasts have a, you know, and series, they have a slant. They're always looking for a miscarriage of justice, something that went wrong, because that's how you get the viewers. That's how you get eyeballs on the TV screen. And so eventually, if you just ended up, if you just watched all of these podcasts and serials and true crime exposés, you would come to the conclusion that the American criminal justice system is a crapshoot. 
that, you know, it's no more reliable than a flip of a coin. And that's simply, you know, I've critiqued the American criminal justice system for racial discrimination, prosecutorial misconduct, and providing bad attorneys to people who are indigent and facing criminal charges. It has a lot, there's a lot of improvement that needs to happen, but it is not a crapshoot. It's not random, it's not arbitrary. If you compare it to many other criminal justice systems across the world, as I've done, I've participated in you know criminal cases in France and the UK and Germany, the American criminal justice system does a very good job of finding out who did crimes and prosecuting them and generally protecting defendants' rights. The very first thing you have to ask of a criminal justice system is, do the police care about solving the crime and do they have the resources to do so? Billions of people live in systems where that is not the case. You know, in China, in India, you know, the criminal justice systems are miles behind. So I think we have to, you know, these these podcasts and series take a very narrow one-sided perspective, always working with arguments that defense lawyers put forward. And they just let the prosecutors on screen for maybe five minutes. And that just leads people to have excessive distrust about the system, which is, you know, very reliable and frankly, Americans should be thankful that our cops are generally not corrupt. They don't ask for bribes, they try to solve cases and they usually get the right people. And our judges are also pretty honest. And so I think you have to, you know, that I'm saying that as a, as a former defense lawyer and a critic, it's, you know, the pendulum has swung too far towards, you know, sort of general blanket criticisms, if you ask me. That's what I found so fascinating about David Simon supporting your piece. I am a, a longtime fan of David Simon. He's someone uh, that I would put on an idol pedestal. I, I, the name of my company is RWSA. It celebrates Mike Royko. That's what the R is for. The W is for Ralph Wiley. The S is for David Simon. And the A is for Michelle Alexander, another huge critic of the criminal justice system. She wrote the book, uh, The New Jim Crow, blah, blah, blah. David Simon, uh, what I loved about him was The Wire. I thought he told the truth in The Wire. I, I, I've, you know, we're at odds, or at least he's at odds with me. I, I'm always gonna love David Simon for The Wire. But you know he 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 doesn't like me anymore, and we don't communicate anymore, and that's fine. But but I was shocked that he would endorse your piece because he's gone so far the other way, uh, where he tends to, his last HBO piece I can't remember the name of it. Uh, we run this town or something, or we run. It was about. It made the Baltimore police just look absolutely horrible. And it was somewhat based on a true story. And, and David has swung where I think he's a little less objective about law enforcement, the criminal justice system. The, the, you know, the wire to me was pitch perfect, showed both sides very objectively. Uh, and so to see him support your work, I don't think you could have gotten a better endorsement than David Simon. Yeah, I would agree with that 100%. I've followed his work since the 90s. I've read his books and I've watched all of his series. To me, the sort of like underlooked, overlooked gem of David Simon is uh, Show Me a Hero from 2015. Loved it. Which is about building public housing in Yonkers. I mean, that's you can't get anything less sexy than that, but he turns it into a great series. I was also totally surprised that he chimed in. And the thing is, he said, I just got sent this piece from a fellow writer in Baltimore. I don't know what the publication is like, but I think these pieces are dispassionate and good. And I think, you know, I, I really agree with your verdict on The Wire, because, you know, working for years in the criminal justice system, so much of that series rang true. You know, Simon knew really how cops think and also, you know, how criminals think and how they interact and all of the really complicated thing is David Simon writes complicated, sophisticated, thoughtful drama. 
And I think basically, you know, I didn't know that he was critical of true crime stuff. But, you know, I bet that, you know, if you interviewed him, I guess you're not on good terms anymore. He's he's a very irascible guy. He's, you know, the angriest man on Twitter, as he says himself. Uh, but, you know, I think he's basically, you know, his idea is that the people on both sides of the law, criminals and cops and detectives, you know, they're humans and they're complex and they have complex motivations. They're never all good, never all bad. And what really causes the problem is institutions that sort of, you know, get their claws around people and crush them. Whether it's a detective trying to fulfill some, you know, stupid quota, or whether it's some guy who just got, you know, pulled over for a broken taillight and they find dope in his car and suddenly he's got a criminal record. You know, the institutions can sort of like crush and reduce people. And he's really good about that and really sensitive about that. And I guess, you know, he sort of thought that I, I had a little bit of the same wavelength. So this next point of reference I want to make connects to Adnan and what he's doing now, because correct me if I'm right or wrong here, he's working for some innocence project that's connected to Georgetown University. Is that accurate? He's working for the Georgetown, I think, Prisons and Justice Initiative, which I, I think may be associated with the Innocence Project, but it's not a direct part of it. It's not part of the law school. It's basically sort of like, I think it's researching uh, maybe like criminal defense in Washington, D.C. and prison conditions and maybe looking at convictions to see if they're justified. Right. And so... And it's not that I'm against it, and, and it'll be interesting, you being a former defense attorney, it's not that I'm against these types of organizations because I think they're necessary. You need a strong advocate on the other side versus the state. You don't want to give the state way too much power because the state will exploit. But 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 th these, have you, have you ever heard of this case out of Chicago? They made a documentary called A Murder in the Park. Are you familiar yes. with this case at all? And, I've watched yeah, that. I've watched that documentary, of, the Anthony Porter case. Oh, yes. It's this guy is a stone cold gang banging killer. Northwestern University and some out of control professor and his college students get this guy exonerated. They frame. You, people have to watch this. They frame a. I never, I'm not politically correct, and so I hope this word doesn't offend you, but I just, I'm 56. I talk the way I always, when I was 14. They've basically framed a retarded man for a murder to get this Anthony Porter out of prison. It, it, it eventually cost this professor at Northwestern University his job and reputation and all that, but these universities and these well-intentioned, uh, I think well-intentioned, uh, progressives, the, and they did all the Anthony Porter deal to basically force the government, the governor, to uh, uh, overthrow or overturn the death penalty in the state of Illinois, and it worked. That case directly led to the governor overturning, rescinding the death penalty in Illinois. And so in their mind, it's like, hey, if Anthony Porter's got to go free for a murder so that we can overturn it, who, who cares? And if our story Simon has to go to prison for a murder he didn't commit, who cares? It's all worth it. But, but I, I guess I, I'm just these universities, these well-intentioned professors, they've created this cottage in industry of you know, we're going to redo the criminal justice system and make it more fair for uh, uh, criminals and convicted people. And, and I think it's hurting the rest of society here in America. Yeah, and, and I would say, I mean, to me, I think there was a drop off in the quality of innocence projects and things like that. Because what happened in the 1990s is you had two things coming together. First, there were all these old convictions which were just based on 
you know, eyewitness identification and questionable forensics and maybe snitches uh, because it was before DNA and before reliable testing, et cetera. And so in the 1990s, when DNA came along, there was a raft of totally legitimate exonerations where DNA evidence actually proves someone else did the crime. And I think recently, you know, that's the low hanging fruit and most of it's been picked. You know, not all cases have DNA. In fact, only about 15% of cases have DNA. So now you've got to rely on people who change their testimony and, uh, you know, people who come forward years and decades after the trial. But I thought, you know, Murder in the Park was very compelling because it showed that these these high school university kids, they were they were great. They were, you know, they were following their professor. But David Protest, you know, got sued because of his questionable tactics in other cases, and he had to leave the university in 2011. And the students who went to the crime scene and said, oh, nobody could have seen the, the crime Anthony Porter committed, they didn't even realize that there had been these large structures built since the time they went there. That meant that, you know, and if you remove those structures, sure, you can see them. And the other thing that's made clear in that documentary is that, you know, they say these eyewitnesses identified Anthony Porter. And you're thinking that <clears throat> some random person in the park sees some guy and picks him out of a lineup. No, these eyewitnesses said we identified Anthony Porter because he is a known bad guy in our neighborhood. And he has a long criminal record. He shot some guy in the head with about a dispute about a dog. So everyone was on the lookout for Anthony Porter because he was really bad news. And we saw him shoot running away from where these people were shot. So they knew him before and they were of the same race as him. That does make a big difference in eyewitness identifications. And so, you know, I think that exoneration was bogus. It shouldn't have happened. And you have these a situation in which a crusading activist professor who believes the criminal justice system is fundamentally corrupt. Most of these professors, by the way, haven't actually practiced as criminal lawyers. Most of them, you know, have a sort of an academic background and then they get their students. And of course, students are gonna be incredibly happy and excited to be possibly contributing to remedying an injustice. And those are all noble impulses, but unless you have the objectivity unless you're willing to do skeptical critiques of your own arguments, unless you're willing to look at all the evidence, you're eventually going to come up with mistakes. And that's something that, you know, the courts are there to try to figure these things out, not professors, not idealistic young students. And so I tend to give courts the benefit of the doubt. And in many of these cases, the courts correctly said, you don't have enough, but everyone's convinced by a podcast that this was an injustice. The state's attorney in uh, Baltimore, or in, why did they just come in out of nowhere and overturn uh, Adnan's conviction? That is a great question. <clears throat> you know, it's a million dollar question because Adnan's last official court appeal had been denied in 2019 by the Maryland Supreme Court. His court case was totally over. And then suddenly, three years later, with no, you know, just out of the blue, with no announcements or anything like that, Marilyn Mosby, has, she hired a woman named Becky Feldman, a lawyer named Becky Feldman. And Becky Feldman was supposed to review cases of juveniles who were serving long sentences. So she took a look at Adnan's case on that grounds. But I guess Becky Feldman became convinced that Adnan's sentence, you know, his conviction was unsound. And so they say they investigated the case for an entire year, starting in October of 2021. And then suddenly, in the middle of September 2022, after all this investigation, they file a motion to vacate his conviction, to, you know, overturn his conviction and make him a free man. And there's a lot of speculation exactly why this occurred. You know, what a lot of people are saying is that Marilyn Mosby, by that time, she had lost the Democratic primary to Ivan Bates, who is now the Baltimore State's Attorney's Office. Um, 
And she was, you know, she was facing an election, but, you know, the Democrat always wins in Baltimore. So, but the pro- the other problem was she is now facing federal fraud charges for misusing COVID funds and lying on a mortgage a- application. And she'd been charged with that months before this motion to vacate. She's still, you know, facing trial. She actually, her entire defense team resigned in, I think, February of this year. So things are not going well for her. And uh, so I think she realized she was heading into legal trouble and she wanted to sort of like bolster her her political base among progressives and, you know, you know, suburban wine moms and activists. And so she thought, here's a case that's gotten, you know, huge publicity. I can free Adnan and that will get people in my column. That's speculation, of course, but it's not implausible, I find. It's not implausible because I think she's, I don't think it's mentioned or referenced in your piece, but my mind immediately went to, uh, this is trying to piggyback off the Freddie Gray uh, controversy and, you know, I'm a crusading person that's going to fix the criminal justice system and I'm on the side of all the people upset about Freddie Gray and I'm going, this is a high profile case and, you know, I'm going to free Adnan and ride off into glory. And, and Andrew, I won't be bothered at all if you pass on this question because this is more of my thought, my perspective. I don't want to draw you into any of my silly or stupid or chauvinistic thoughts. But again, when you start talking about <laughs> Mar- Marilyn Mosby, the Beth woman, uh, Rabia, Sarah Caney, I- I- I'm this overly sympathetic view of anybody caught up in the criminal justice system. I I, I just, men, I think, are capable of making the exact same mistake, but I just don't see it as a coincidence that there seems to be an overabundance of of women uh, being sympathetic towards these guys. And and just to be fair, take a murder in the park. other than maybe some female students, these were men that, that did this crime to Al Story Simon and got Anthony Porter. So I want to be fair. Again, men, exact same thing. But, but man, it just seems like we've gone overboard with sympathy toward, towards uh, criminals. Throw myself in it. I gave up a thousand bucks in Adnan's defense. I fell for it, too. And, and so uh, as I sit here and just think this out loud, I, I, don't, I shouldn't just put this on women. It's all of us. We've just gone overboard with sympathy towards criminals. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, there's, it is a pretty obvious pattern among a lot of these documentaries. Amy Berg directed the, a documentary about the West Memphis Three and also about Adnan's case, Sarah Koenig, et cetera. I also have experience from death row in which my clients, no matter what the kind of crime they had done, they got love letters from women from all over the world and they often married them. And the women would move to like rural Texas to be next to death row next to their men you know, the, the death row inmates that they'd murdered. There's actually like a psychological term for this called bristophilia, like, you know, falling in love with very proud, very determined men. And I just, you know, on the other side, though, there's a lot of hard-headed female judges, especially in Adnan's case. And uh, so, for instance, the judge who wrote the opinion striking down Marilyn Mosby's motion to vacate, her name is Catherine Grafe. She's a former prosecutor and no nonsense. And she wrote that opinion and it is devastating to Marilyn Mosby and Becky Feldman. And another female judge, you know, first of all, also the judge at Adnan's trial was a woman, an African-American woman named Wanda Keys Heard. And she did a great job presiding over the trial, sharp as a tack, fantastic work, excellent judgments. And she's come out and given affidavits saying, listen, this, you know, so, and then not only that, but 
at uh, on the Maryland Supreme Court when Adnan lost in 2019. It was another African-American female judge, Shirley S. Watts, first black female judge on the Maryland Supreme Court, who wrote a very, very devastating opinion, pointing out that Asia McLean's alibi testimony was not accurate and not reliable and possibly fraudulent. But, you know, I see your, you know, some women get into a situation where, where they have sort of like a savior syndrome and, you know, they have a tendency to want to take care of people and to remedy injustice, et cetera. I'm not going to say these traits are inborn, but, you know, that's one of the reasons we love women is because they have that side. And so I'm not going to say that, you know, there's women on all sides of all of these cases. But, yeah, you do sometimes see situations in which women get involved on a sort of personal level and put their identification with somebody who they find sympathetic above their reasoning ability. And, you know, Sarah Koenig in in Serial says exactly this. She says, I know it's idiotic, but one of the reasons I think Adnan might be innocent is because of his beautiful dairy cow brown eyes. She says, I know it's idiotic, but I think, could this guy have really strangled his girlfriend? And, you know, I'd say as kind of a cynical lawyer, dude, yeah. But I can see how, you know, there might be a bit of a gendered aspect to this. <laughs> I, I, this is, I wasn't planning to ask this, but just as we're having the conversation, I'm just thinking of things because obviously I love this true crime stuff because I just keep thinking of all these cases that I've fallen down the rabbit hole. But wh where did you come down on Michael Peterson and the staircase? And is my memory not right? Wasn't there some woman in France or some other country that fell in love with him and she, she was maybe the editor of the documentary and, and, and she was his strongest advocate? Am, am I mixing up the cases I'm thinking about? Now, I think off the top of my head, it's been a while since I watched The Staircase, but I do think that that was true because it was a French production. And I remember reading an article saying that one of the people involved in the production was close to him and had you know, developed some kind of a relationship with him. And uh, so, yes. yeah, that and frankly, that's something that really ought to be disclosed at the very beginning of each episode of The Staircase, that somebody closely involved in making this film has personal feelings for Where'd you come down on that case? Do, do you, because uh, if I, yep. I may be I, of the position that the, the owl did it, uh, but <laughs> maybe I'm foolish for thinking that. Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting case, and I haven't gotten too deep into it. The owl strike theory, at first I laughed about it, but then, you know, there are cases of owls actually inflicting severe in injuries this way because they're silent. They, you know, they make no noise. You don't know one is coming up, and they have really sharp talons and claws. I mean, I'm going to need a little bit more convincing before I endorse the owl theory. And actually the case is over now. He entered what's called an Alford plea. So he basically, I'm pretty sure I remember this correctly. So it's a kind of plea yeah. in which you say, I know the state can convict me based on its evidence, but I still maintain my innocence, but I'm going to plead guilty. So the case is over. And you know, it, I mean, it's a really weird crime because basically the forensic evidence is is kind of questionable. It's hard to see how she got those air, those injuries just by falling down a staircase. Um, but at the same time, you know, Peterson and Peterson's theory is, you know, I was just out there waiting by the pool and I didn't hear anything. I really don't know where I fall down on it. I think basically that was a good resolution for the case. Peterson goes before a court, says, you can prove me guilty. I claim my innocence. I accept the penalty. And he's out. But you know, the, I, I thought it was actually good in the staircase that they looked into the prior incident of a woman who David, you know, who Peterson knew <laughs> falling down the story. stairs. I did give him credit for that. You know, that was you know, objectivity. There is a cer certain pattern here we should think about. Andrew, thank you so much uh, for taking the time, uh, particularly the, the time difference. Look, there's a seven hour time difference. Really appreciate it. I could talk about this stuff all day. I've watched so many of these. I, I've, 
I, I, we didn't even get to talk about my favorite one is Paradise Lost, the whole West Memphis three deal, because I was so convinced they were innocent. And then by the time I got done about a year and a half, in, I was like, no, these guys are dead guilty. It, it, it ain't even close. Uh, th these things are fascinating. It's amazing the impact they're having on the criminal justice system and how we perceive our criminal justice system here in America. You really help. We need an outsider's view. We need someone detached from America taking a look and bringing some real perspective. Thank you so much for the work you've done. Thank you for, so much for sharing this time with us. Awesome job. I know it doesn't mean as much coming from me as it does David Simon, but it's still a good recommendation. You guys should read this piece on Quillette. And uh, Andrew will be following the rest of your work. Can't wait for your next piece. Uh, that's Andrew Hamill. I hope that some of you guys in our audience are true crime uh, people like me and understand the impact that this true crime stuff is having on our criminal justice system. Again, you wanna know why people ran out in the streets in 2020 and pretended like George Floyd was some kind of a saint? Because they've overdosed on all this true crime stuff and have been convinced that our criminal justice system is the worst thing in the world. And I couldn't give you a stronger recommendation than watching the documentary, A Murder in the Park, and doing the research on, uh, again, Anthony Porter. I mean, cold-blooded, gang-banging, Chicago murderer. They got this dude dead to rights. And a group of liberals on a Northwestern college campus out to prove how they're not racist, frame, frame a retarded man, a mentally challenged man for this murder. They frame him, get the gangbanging killer out of prison. I think the gangbanging prisoner ended up getting several million dollars from the state, if my memory serves me right, It's all bogus, but that, that's, we've created an environment where people can do this and people will believe anything said about our criminal justice system. Oh, it's all corrupt and every, half the guys in prison are innocent. And you know what, I think there is a large, a significant percentage of people in prison who are innocent of the crime they were convicted of. Let's say it's 10%. But of that 10%, the reason why they're in prison is because of all the other BS that they did. Again, you, you, again, it's no different than George Floyd, Eric Garner, Ahmaud Arbery. Until they start bringing me a consistent level of these cases where it's like, oh man, that was a straight A student in high school and he was off in college and you know what? He had never been arrested before and the police shot him and killed him. That, that's when they'll get my attention. And I say that as someone, I talk about it on this show all the time. All right, admit it. Cousin, I helped raise, killed by police. And it, it was terrible, it hurts my family, it hurts his mama to this day, it hurts our entire family. The kid could have been awesome, but he was a criminal. Love him to death, look at his picture every day. But he consistently made choices that put him in harm's way. There's not, there are very few, there are victims, but there are very few innocent victims. Very few. The, the reason why they haven't bring, been able to bring you a story about, oh, well, here's the college kid that uh, went to church every Sunday and, and had straight A's in high school and he got killed by police. The reason why they haven't been able to bring you that story is because those kids don't resist arrest. Those kids, when they get pulled over by the police, say, yes, sir, no, sir, thank you, ma'am, appreciate it, blah, blah, what can I do? I, I got pulled over two weeks ago, going 90. I, I, I'm trying to 
fight my habit of speeding. I got pulled over going down. I pulled over so quick. It, it, the policeman almost went past me because I pulled over so quick, had my window down so quick, had my license out the window so quick, and registration out the so quick. It, it was all before the policeman could even park his car and get out of his car. All my information was waiting on him as he walked up. Seven minutes later, I was back on the highway with a warning ticket. <laughs> they can tell you that, oh, God, all these racist white police officers, they just can't wait, blah, blah, blah. Me and this guy didn't have one harsh word. He was so appreciative of my cooperation. Warning ticket on my way seven minutes later. It, it anyway, uh, I love this show today because I, I love talking about this issue and trying to explain to people the bigger picture of, of how they're using these documentaries and all this other stuff to wreck our perception of our criminal justice system and sparking all this animus and all this anti-police sentiment, the HBO's in on it, all the, how can a newspaper in Baltimore, as high profile as this serial case is, they let some dude in Germany tell the true story about what went on with Adnan Saeed? No one in Baltimore? No, Washington Post? Jeff Bezos' operation? All that money they got, they couldn't get to the bottom of the story? Had to be a dude in Germany? All right, play tomorrow, we'll see you next week.